everybody. Welcome to the third episode of the Gabriel Salim Foundation's live series, Consulting Without Borders Perspectives, in which we feature prominent international consultants and experts doing work related to global challenges. Happy May 1st, happy May Day. I just want to say that because um, this day is usually celebrated uh, in, in many countries. I just did a little research this morning. I looked it up and actually in over 80 countries, it's still celebrated as a Labor Day or you know, Workers' Day. Uh, in some countries, it's not celebrated, like, for example, in the Netherlands, where I'm currently broadcasting from. But this morning, I took a walk and I saw that many people um, walked on the streets uh, with flowers. And I know that there is a tradition to give flowers on, on May 1st to your friends and, and the neighbors. Uh, in some countries, it's celebrated just according to the pagan tradition as the beginning of summer. So it's a it's a nice day, uh, and wherever you are, I uh, just want to say that we will be talking about Central Asia today. And in Central Asia, May first is actually celebrated as uh, the Day of the People's uh, Unity. We also often associate May first with peace, and. I just wanted to say and to remind you uh, to be you know, grateful if you are now in the place and the location and the country which is in peace and uh, which is not in some kind of a conflict. And just to think about it as how lucky we are, you know, many of us who are in a peaceful place and to remind you that unfortunately not uh, everywhere there is peace on earth there are many conflict zones there is still wars happening and of course ukraine comes to mind and we think about it a lot these days and in fact on april 1st we had our own a director of this foundation stephen tapper who joined us live from ukraine uh, where he was helping with a humanitarian aid uh, it was a month ago, and uh, today is May 1st, and the war there is still going on. And I just wanted to say uh, on this day, I wish that this word peace, which we usually say on May 1st, does not just mean a word, it's not just a word, but it becomes a reality for many people who are living in the war now. Today, uh, I would like to introduce you to a guest that we have, Dr. Raman Vakulchuk, who will be joining us from Norway. And while I'm introducing him, uh, please post in comments where you are joining from. We will see that right here. You can post it directly on uh, any social media that you're using to watch this broadcast, whether it's Facebook or you know, Twitter or the YouTube, please just say where you are, are, are tuning in from. We'll be happy to hear from you. So uh, our guest today again is Raman Vakulchuk, who is head of Center for Energy Research at Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. And today we'll be having a conversation with him on green energy research, climate change, and consulting. Raman specializes in emerging markets, energy, and climate change. He also has extensive experience in project, managing, uh, project management, fundraising, market foresight, investment consulting, and establishing business networks, specifically in Central Asia, where he is originally from. Raman is now leading the climate team at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, which is a big a think tank, and he's responsible for developing an environmental policy at the Institute. He has also worked on various projects funded by international organizations, such as Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, German Development Cooperation, and Global Development Network. 
Roman holds a PhD degree from uh, Jacobs University in Germany. I'm bringing Roman here now, and we can talk more about his experience and what he will be sharing with us today. Welcome, Roman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Victoria. Uh, as always, it's a big pleasure uh, to, to share the, the same platform uh, with you. Uh, and I'm very much uh, thankful for the invitation. Uh, and indeed, uh, today I, th I think is a quite a special day. Um, well, it's the 1st of May, it's a holiday for, for many countries. Uh, and it's also maybe a little bit symbolic that, um, as you asked me, uh, I would be telling some stories from my own career, which will also relate to my work. So, um, and why, uh, like, working hard, it's what 1st of May requires, why can it be important and also why it's sometimes can be helpful in many ways. Um, so I'm really happy uh, just to maybe to just what you said for your very nice introduction. I would just maybe say that um, um, the, the topics that we will uh, cover today, they in fact some of the um, uh, core, I would say, core interests that I've had during my career, which I started uh, starting from 2008. This is a time when I can say what I uh, basically I started working in different organizations um, and in parallel also I was working uh, to develop my uh, PhD dissertation in Germany, as you said. Uh, so maybe I will just start uh, from the point of view that um, I have a background uh, in economics, but as you said, originally I'm from Kazakhstan, from Central Asia, and maybe that's why it was quite natural for me uh, to focus on this region. Uh, focus on this region as a researcher, but also as a consultant. Uh, and Roman, I just wanted, to... I'm sorry, I just wanted to, to briefly interrupt and just say that uh, we are, I'm, I'm so happy to have you in our show today. And maybe it's the first time that we are actually in the same uh, time zone, because normally we are many hours apart, just like a lot of our viewers are there in different parts of the world. But today, actually, I am in the Netherlands and Roman is, is Norway. So we are in the same time zone, the same hour, and that's quite amazing. And as I said, I am uh, broadcasting not from my usual room in, uh, in, in my house in, in Florida, but today I'm actually in my daughter's apartment. She's a student in the Netherlands, so that's where I am. And I know that Raman, he just shared with me that he just moved to a new place in, in Oslo, right? He just got uh, to a new apartment, and uh, we just want to wish you, you know, happy Happy moving, happy <laughs> having, a, it's it's a great day to, to move. Uh, and I'm so happy that you found the time to, to join us as well. Sorry for the interruption, just wanted to, uh, Thank to you, say Victoria. that. Uh, yes, uh, great to be in the same time zone. Uh, and I think this also worked out well in terms of uh, organization. Hopefully, technically, we will not have any issues. Um, so, right, I mean, although we are based in so many different places, uh, I think we all, uh, have the same interest in terms of our relation to Central Asia. And maybe this is what uh, we can uh, maybe start from, uh, talking about consulting and its, uh, for example, unique maybe characteristics of doing consulting in Central Asia, uh, why it's unique and what makes it so special. And of course, my views uh, may be quite, uh, well, to some extent, I would say they may be biased. Uh, that's. And I think that's okay because I'm just trying to share my personal experiences and also my personal insights. Uh, but I still hope that maybe some of the insights would echo in maybe other people's uh, careers and also backgrounds. And also maybe there'll be some things that would be interesting to learn, um, including also our, when it comes to our session uh, with the questions uh, for which I think, yeah, you're all free to, to type your questions that we can touch upon uh, during our conversation. Uh, so let me then start first with, as I said, as I started talking about uh, the relation to Central Asia and the um, the consulting and my history in it. Um, so when I started working uh, in Central Asia, before that I had a experience from studying in uh, in Europe. And this is, uh, was the period when I realized that uh, the world has been gradually moving uh, towards um, universalization of 
uh, best practices in consulting. I think this trend started probably after the year 2000. Uh, and uh, I think that many international organizations have been quite active in terms of promoting best practices when it comes to, for example, advising different businesses on how to perform uh, according to the certain standards and uh, best practices. Uh, and this is also what I was learning at uh, different universities in Europe, uh, in particular in Germany, but also Sweden. Uh, this is also kind of part of my studies where we looked at, again, existing, uh, existing best practices uh, when it comes to uh, the advice and consulting of uh, small and medium-sized enterprises or large companies in different areas. Uh, while I realized that this was important over years, I also realized that um, any consultant who is supposed to be a professional and sticking to high standards should also have very good understanding of the local context. Uh, so in my view, each consultant has this choice of either sticking you know, to this universal best practices of how to promote uh, or like advice on doing good business, uh, how to promote, for example, high standards in doing business. Uh, but also uh, another dimension here is that the a consultant should also be very much knowledgeable and familiar with the business environment in a country where he or she works. And in this regard, I think that uh, that's a quite a challenge for a consultant to be uh, active in both parts, but this is what makes a successful consultant. Um, sometimes it's quite unfortunate that um, international, for example, international consultants and also advisors, they tend to uh, to use mainly the best practices, uh, for example, applying experience from Asian countries to Africa or from Africa to Asian countries or from Latin America to, for example, to some Asian countries. Um, and I, from my also experience, there were some projects where um, several experts, um, they were kind of specializing in other regions, but they were invited to contribute to new regions. And of course, uh, this is not always optimal uh, because again the knowledge of the uh, of the local context is some often is the key and so i would say if you ask me what like what's the how it, um, an ideal consultant would look like and I, I should say that it's someone who has quite extensive uh, and broad experience from the region where he or she works but also like having experience with i know being kind of exposed to some international practices why, why I said that? I said that because it's important that when we talk about Central Asia, that the region is so unique in many ways that um, uh, just by, for example, having experience working in uh, uh, North America and can then coming to consult businesses in Central Asia can be a little bit painful, especially at the beginning. Uh, as often, you know, those things that you think that uh, should work or should look like, that, that like this, they're often different. Uh, so what does really make Central Asia so unique? Uh, I would say that, uh, well, purely geographical characteristics should come into play. That's, that's an important factor. Uh, Central Asia is uh, almost double landlocked region. Uh, so unlike many other regions which have access to sea, uh, which uh, make them very, you know, very uh, advantageous and also uh, I would say in many ways, this uh, makes them kind of the winners of uh, being exposed to this access to sea. Uh, in the case of Central Asia, this access is basically, you know, it's not available. It's, uh, it's very limited, which makes the cooperation between countries in the region very, uh, you know, very important. For example, for countries which are landlocked, it's way more important to interact with each other and cooperate than for countries that share the same borders, but at the same time have access to sea because those countries are more flexible. They can find other partners, for example. While, double, uh, while landlocked countries are really in need to be as uh, you know, friendly and cooperative with each other as possible. But what's happening in Central Asia, and this is what has been happening since 1991, is that the region is actually one of the least integrated regions in the world. Uh, so this is, I think, one of the unique characteristics. So at the state level, we see a lot of processes that have been actually moving in the direction of disintegration. But this is at the state level. 
Because if you look at the level of people-to-people -people connections, Central Asia is in fact very connected. Um, and uh, so you have many uh, different types of ties between people. For example, it can be family ties. It's also ties that uh, basically relates maybe to some, you know, broader families or communities of people. Uh, and we know that also there are many different ethnic groups that live uh, in uh, neighboring countries, like, for example, uh, communities from Uzbekistan live in Kyrgyzstan or and also like Kazakhstan, where I'm from myself, also uh, hosts more than 100 different ethnic groups, which makes it quite unique. Uh, then the question is, of course, how about business to business interaction? And there I would say that it's quite interesting that Central Asia remains uh, in a quite a, I would say, still, uh, you know, very slow motion in terms of uh, joint work between different types of businesses. Um, and it's, I think there's, this makes it re the region quite special because there's so much room for improvement. And it also means that there's so many different areas for potential engagement from international consultants. Uh, and I think that our good colleague and uh, of course, very, very good friend, Gabriel Al-Salem, uh, I think he was one of the first um, international consultants who made this important move to, to, to to enter uh, the markets of Central Asia, and I think, and I think that uh, Gabriel was especially uh, in, well known for his uh, work on the particular types of business and business consulting, and that's the business advisory services to small and medium-sized enterprises. I think we should be thankful to Gabriel for promoting and contributing to this area to con to consult different businesses on. Uh, for example, um, obtaining access to capital, to uh, joint work between countries, uh, be between companies in the region, uh, so that uh, there's more, you know, business to business cooperation at the level of, for example, uh, private uh, enterprises, both small and medium sized, but also large, large enterprises. So that's what I'm talking about. So I think that Gabriel uh, had a visionary look in terms of looking at the um, at the region, and uh, in this regard, I think that uh, uh, he initiated many important uh, tendencies uh, in terms of uh, international attention to the region. And now we know, of course, that also Central Asia hosts many different international organizations, especially Kyrgyzstan has been very active in this regard, um, that uh, many international consultants are working there. But again, uh, one has to be cautious because, uh, as I said before, the region is so unique, um, it's so, um, also interesting to work in that region that uh, one really has to learn and take time, really take time, take two, one, two years to really have a good understanding of the local business culture, uh, local um, business traditions. Um, and, and I'm also mentioning this because uh, I would like maybe to use it as an opportunity to say a few words about the book that I'm currently writing. So at the moment I'm developing a book where I'll be looking at the culture of doing business in Central Asia. Um, I think this book has not been written before and uh, I was very much ex uh, inspired by my colleagues, by co colleagues from the uh, from Kazakhstan, uh, for example, uh, Gulsum Akhtamberdiva, who was my mentor, also by Gabriel, by many other mentors that I had in my life. Um, so this is where I will try to actually show what makes Central Asia unique and what are the particular characteristics of the of the culture of doing business. So um, that's kind of one particular layer if it comes to understanding the region. Another one, and this I think would relate more to the to the question of green energy transition, uh, which I think is also a very important topic of our today's conversation. Uh, and here I would like to connect Central Asia to this topic in a sense that um, uh, Central Asia is also, while also while being unique, it's also at the same time um, is a laggard in many international uh, processes. So basically what happens internationally usually comes at a later stage to, to Central Asia. Uh, this, this, for example, can, can relate to the issues regarding climate change, um, so just to give you one example is that, um, well, Central Asia is one of the uh, most exposed regions to climate change in the world uh, because the uh, 
the average temperature that is actually uh, you know on the rise in the region it's actually higher uh, than the global average just to give you one example um, and so while this has been the case one can see that international organizations and also international local consultants uh, have started to look at the issue only recently while for i would say for a good of uh, two decades uh, the issue of climate change and also green, maybe green consulting has not really been on the agenda in Central Asia. Uh, now we see some tendencies to, to basically to pay more attention to it. And I think uh, uh, the international organizations, they're playing an important role by raising awareness. Um, but I think that experts and consultants have not been really uh, looking very much into this direction. Uh, and. Uh, in such an important area as energy transition, global energy transition, which is today is becoming even more important, um, given uh, all the disadvantages of uh, the use of fossil fuels, uh, the shift to, uh, to renewable energy is becoming even more acute and more important. Again, in this regard, Central Asia uh, is a quite an interesting region for investors, for also consultants, because um, we, you know that for the energy transition, uh, a lot of input of different uh, critical materials is required. Uh, critical materials like uh, copper, cobalt, lithium, um, and nickel, and many others. So they are needed to, uh, in order to produce solar panels and also uh, wind turbines uh, in order to accelerate the energy transition. And while uh, Many other regions have been very much in the spotlight uh, and there was a lot of attention paid to uh, the countries of Latin America or to some other Asian countries like, for example, of course, China, but also many African countries. They have been in very much uh, in attention for the last 15 years in terms of um, the expanding of production of critical materials. Central Asia, again, was not really much of a part of this discourse, part of this discussion. And only recently, one uh, started seeing, you know, some tendencies. And I recently published a paper with my colleague where we're actually showing that Central Asia indeed has a quite substantial uh, reserves in different uh, minerals. Um, and especially with such minerals as uh, um, uh, copper, iron, uh, also um, silver, uh, I think also there's a substantial amount of uh, lithium reserves, which are very much uh, used, um, which makes Central Asia potentially a very important player in the global energy transition because the region can actually help to, uh, you know, to supply this uh, much needed reserves for, for the global uh, players. Uh, moreover, I think that we know that Central Asia has been for decades very much dependent on fossil fuels exports, right? Uh, it's mainly... Uh, such uh, countries as Kazakhstan, um, also Turkmenistan, to a less extent of Pakistan, have been very much dependent on uh, the exports of hydrocarbons as a source of their revenue. Uh, and many, of course, talked about this uh, particular dependence of the region on these uh, fossil fuels, uh, which, of course, was often uh, seen as an obstacle for uh, diversification of the economies. And I think that many consultants also did so many studies showing like what are the main disadvantages of sticking to the use of these resources uh, as basically as the only source of revenue for the economy. Um, and I think that uh, just a few years ago, right, so we had a situation when uh, during the pandemic, when the prices for oil, they were negative. Uh, basically, I know that in Texas, uh, oil cost like minus three dollars so that the seller would actually pay you, you know, that you you buy the, the, the oil. So this was during the pandemic. And today we have the price that jumped by $150. And if you look at this 156 uh, degree difference, right, in terms of the price of the oil, one can see this, you know, enormous volatility of, uh, again, using um, these fossil fuel resources as a, you know, as a stable instrument for, supporting the economies because it cannot be stable when it can you know uh, be so volatile and uh, when the price can really make a huge uh, basically surges or basically falling so rapidly 
Um, in that regard, yes, uh, if you look at some of the critical materials and if you take into account the region's dependence on fossil fuels, I think it's important then by developing this area of critical minerals, Central Asia can become an important player, uh, changing its status from being um, one of the global hubs of uh, fossil fuels to becoming a more um, green oriented, so like a region that can actually help in many ways accelerate the energy transition in the world. Uh, also, I think that uh, we often look at the reports of international organizations like the World Bank, which predict that achieving energy transition is possible by 2040 or by 2050. But again, uh, I think that uh, often many things are taken for granted in the sense that many believe that all the necessary materials and supplies will be there. There'll be no shortages of those. But actually some agencies, they predict that, for example, the, the, uh, the demand growth for some of those minerals will actually achieve more than 1,000% by 2040. Um, and also like for some of the minerals, the expected growth for the demand growth is expected to be even 8,000% which means that basically one has to uh, increase the, the, the production of those minerals at the, at the pace which is incomparable with the current, uh, current state of mining and production. So one really would have to expand it a lot. Um, and we know that uh, basically countries that, uh, let's say, belong to the OECD world, so countries which are, do not belong to the emerging economies, so it's the European countries, uh, the United States, Canada. In, in those countries, uh, it's now quite difficult to obtain new mining licenses. So in order to start new mining process, I mean, it takes a really lot of time, can take up, up to five to 10 years, for example, to open a new mining site. Uh, this, this means basically that it's uh, stakeholder coordination is so important. Uh, basically, the interests of all stakeholder groups need to be take into account that negotiations take place, but it's still unclear whether there'll be approval of new mining sites. And this issue actually has implications for the developing countries because uh, it's not that difficult yet to start new mining in uh, more developing countries for a number of reasons, uh, which again puts basically most of the burden on the developing economies in terms of uh, the future supply of the needed materials. Um, so this makes Central Asia very relevant in this global energy transition. Uh, but it also, I think that, uh, it, as I said before, it came quite late in this whole debate. So it's really time to catch up and to be actively, you know, following in those trends, uh, becoming interesting for different investors. And I think that's, that's the role for consultants. Those consultants who are based in Central Asia, uh, those consultants that are interested in the region um, can also look into this in, into more detail in order to, to serve as a bridge for international investors, for local governments, local authorities, and basically to put all different stakeholders together in order to really uh, accelerate uh, and find a way to you know, make the region uh, quite special in this whole global energy transition. Thank Having you. Said, Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, I just wanted to... Uh, also add that yeah this is this is a great perspective on uh, the role of central asia in the the renewable uh, energy industry and uh, what you've been talking about I actually i i read your paper on on fossil fuels uh, in central asia and it was quite interesting i, I think it's still in the process right it's uh, what what you you have is still like an abstract and it just says that Central Asia definitely is talking about uh, promoting renewable energy, but has not done much in that in a, you know direction. And it still act is actively using uh, coal, uh, natural gas, and oil. And in fact, is expanding uh, expanding it. And there are no there are plans to switch to renewable energy, but there are no plans to actually phase out. Uh, oil, gas, and coal. Is that is that correct? Uh, thank you very much, Victoria, for raising this important question. Uh, indeed, uh, having said uh, and presented the situation with the potential for critical minerals, that's one part of the story. Another part of the story, if we look at the region itself and what's happening, 
uh, with energy transition uh, and the unfortunately the so far the outlook is not so positive despite of course the existing rhetoric and also the plans to develop uh, solar and wind energy so basically yes the region has potential for uh, wind, uh, solar, also hydro energy, and uh, hydro energy has been used for many decades already. But the problem is that when everyone talks about uh, the green side of energy transition, namely clean energy, one tends to forget about the the dirty side, so to say, so the the, uh, the decarbonization aspect. So how, while making progress towards renewables, how to make sure that one also, you know, reduces the consumption of fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas. Um, and uh, recent studies that were done in this area looking at the region showed that, yes, Central Asia is making some slow progress on renewables. I can just give you a number. Uh, well, Kazakhstan uses around 3%, uh, basically produces 3% of electricity from clean energy, which is quite a progress compared to what was in 2013 when uh, when the share of renewables was less than 1%. So it's 3% growth over eight, year, eight, eight years, which is, which is quite good. But uh, also, if you look at the same time, if you look at the exports of hydrocarbons and the consumption, again, domestically of coal and uh, natural gas oil, you still see that they keep on expanding. Uh, and this is, of course, not so... Uh, positive and not so, I would say, sustainable in the long term. For the first of all, it's not sustainable because uh, there might be international pressure and risks coming from the so-called uh, carbon tax. Uh, at the moment, the European Union is discussing the introduction of the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism, which would place uh, all countries which are big, big emitters of greenhouse gas emissions and also uh, those which consume a lot of fossil fuels, that they would have to pay extra in order to be able to trade with the European Union. So if this carbon tax is, ex is adopted in 2025, which is the plan at the moment, I think this also means quite significant risks for the natural uh, uh, resource industries in Central Asia. And I'm also developing a paper uh, to show actually the, the risks that are very concrete and clear uh, that I think there should be discussions uh, started as soon as possible in order to identify or maybe also try to mitigate those risks for the region. So uh, that's one, one thing. Another disadvantage of sticking to, you know, to the oil and gas in the future is because that we know, uh, I mean, there's also, it's, they can be kind of quite harmful for the local environment, but also like for the, um, for the human health, there was a study. There actually, there were many studies that look at the impact of coal, of the uh, the burning of coal on the health of the population. And if you look at the from the point of view of thirty years, so like you 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 trace how much coal combustion actually can impact the health of the population over the period of thirty years, you would see quite strong um, correlations between the you know the excessive use of, for example, coal and also the sum of negative impact on the uh, of the health of the population. So that's the second second important uh, factor here. Third, I think that by actually looking more in the fossil fuels, Central Asia is losing many important and actually large international investment. Because uh, if you look at the global uh, stage, you see that there are more and more international donors and funders and also in the private investors who are very much interested in investing in renewable energy. Uh, and I think that more and more uh, billions of dollars are being, you know, um, being provided by the special funds to countries which uh, actually provide special conditions for like making their investment climate for, for example, clean energy more attractive. Uh, and I think there are many examples that can be quite interesting, uh, basically, to mention. Uh, for example, uh, Vietnam is a country that one could look at because it made a huge progress recently uh, with solar and uh, wind energy, and they managed to attract billions of investment, which is also quite, I think, beneficial for the local population. Uh, first of all, it's just a direct financial investment. Second, also that... Uh, we know that in Central Asia, the issue of labor migration is quite important, right? And in, in many ways, it's a problem for the region. 
but the good thing about renewable energy is that it requires more labor than fossil fuels. So if you look at the like per one gigawatt of power, um, well, for example, electricity, you need basically less labor for fossil fuels compared to solar energy. So uh, by developing more renewables, one could also, you know, uh, address the issue of unemployment in the region. And maybe also parts of the labor migrants could be involved and could be uh, basically employed by this new sector in the region, in a sense, helping the you know local governments to, to, to solve this issue of unemployment, but also like the, this uh, high rate of uh, outgoing migration to countries like uh, Russia or Kazakhstan. So that just another example that Central Asia is actually missing an opportunity to be an important uh, player in this regard. Uh, again, I would maybe being myself a consultant and uh, I'm just trying to also to, to work in this area and uh, work in concrete projects in order to bring more attention and to raise awareness. Uh, and uh, also uh, there's a plan to establish a risk assessment center in the region in order to be uh, able to help companies, for example, to look into the possible risks uh, of, for example, um, you know, uh, not sticking to high environmental standards. So how private companies can mitigate those risks in order to uh, basically not to be um, among the losers or like or do not have any financial losses from this process. Yeah, Raman, I think this might be actually your, your response to the question that Gulsum had about how to move in this direction. And mm -hmm. I, I believe that consultants uh, actually have a, a big role in that because they can really guide their clients, uh, the, the private companies, right, or the government agencies in what those should be doing. But I also think that, of course, it's probably a political issue to some extent, right? So, and it really, mm -hmm. uh, it should, it probably will, will start happening when there will be the political you know, will to do that. Although, uh, yeah, I, I hope that uh, starting from the bottom, uh, and that work will, will, will also benefit mm. moving in, in, in the direction of using more renewable energy. Is yeah. that correct? Absolutely. Victoria, I think that, of course, consultants cannot solve all the problems and issues, but I think they can, they can serve uh, this important uh, role of, uh, you know, uh, awareness raising and also then basically adjusting companies, uh, changing them to strategies which are more environmentally friendly and also, I mean, in many ways, by being more in, uh, kind of, say, green company, it means also more benefits. Uh, if you look, for example, at the international financial markets and so on, or if you look at the how you are treated in the international business community. But you're right, uh, political will is absolutely necessary. I think one fundamental problem here, and I think this is uh, something that can maybe address the question from Ron Finch, as I see it, um, yeah. where he says that attracting investment will be important to facilitate the move away from fossil fuel, which dominates the energy landscape. Um, indeed, attracting investment is complicating and challenging, and challenging here, uh, but I would say there's one fundamental issue here. Um, often uh, in the countries of Central Asia, but also in broader Eurasia, uh, clean energy is perceived to be a, a, uh, you know, direct replacement for fossil fuels. And when there is such choice for, for example, policymakers that, okay, like uh, in two years, you have to change all the energy infrastructure, uh, like 100% make it renewable. This, of course, is quite unrealistic. Uh, and there's also pressure from the, you know, different stakeholder groups. Uh, so in many ways, renewable energy is seen as a threat to the existing energy infrastructure. Uh, so in order to really to make some progress in this area, I would maybe, you know, for me, at least personally, I always find the, the, the case of India as very interesting and fascinating because India uh, is a country that also uses a lot of fossil fuels Domestically, uh, also uh, India imports a lot of resources from abroad. But uh, several decades ago, India also decided to uh, develop rapidly renewable energy. 
And so this country is quite unique because it managed uh, to establish the whole new clean energy industry uh, in terms of, for example, wind or solar energy. Uh, they managed to attract a lot of investment. And today, India is one of the biggest actual destinations for clean energy investment. So what India did uh, is that they didn't fully uh, reject the use of fossil fuels in order to use uh, for, uh, re uh, renewable energy, but they started to develop this process in parallel. And I think uh, developing them in parallel is the only way which can actually you know, bring some progress over time because by making a quite uh, you know, gradual changes, you take into account also the interests of other stakeholders group. You also manage to, you know, reduce the consumption of fossil fuels over time. Uh, because, again, doing it drastically, rapidly is very difficult. Although, of course, in global terms, we need it, right? So, I mean, climate is not waiting. It's changing so fast. So, of course, we need very quick solutions. But in order to really to move forward, one really has to find a way of developing it in parallel, not seeing clean energy as a threat. Again, even now we have the situation that many countries in Europe saying that they would wait with fully, you know, uh, shutting down their, for example, coal mines because of the ongoing war in Ukraine, which again means that it's likely that those countries will continue using fossil fuels, right? So it's very important then for the region to, to find a way to develop it, not see it as a so, sort of a, as a threat to the interests of other stakeholder groups. And so India today, for example, they have two ministries, one ministry for oil and gas and then another ministry for renewable energy. Um, this also shows that how much attention the government pays to it. Uh, and also I know that there's a, um, like two big groups of consultants in India that work on these two different energy areas. So I think this is a very interesting example and also interesting experience for Central Asia to look at, to see how this can be developed further. Uh, and maybe finally on this note regarding the energy transition in Central Asia, I would probably say that, um, of course, I mean, the governments, they carry a responsibility for making change, for reforming the industry, but we also shouldn't forget uh, the role of external players. Um, countries like China or the countries of the European Union, and also I think that partly in the Netherlands where Shell, the company, uh, where I also had an uh, experience of working. I could also maybe tell a few words in a second. Um, so Shell based in uh, the Netherlands and the UK, uh, the Italian company, Eni and many others, uh, despite uh, so many calls you know, the, to Central Asia to become more green and uh, basically more sustainable in, the, in terms of its development, uh, private companies from these countries, they keep on investing in fossil fuels in Central Asia. So, for example, the European Union often comes with the initiative to uh, start a new dialogue on energy transition, to build capacity among the local authorities in Central Asia, to help them, you know, to use some environmental tools in assessing, uh, for example, their progress or strategies. But then if you look at what private companies do from these countries, they keep on investing and expanding the uh, fossil fuel, like traditional energy infrastructure. Uh, the same is actually with China. Uh, we did another study recently where we looked at uh, in which projects did China invest in energy over the last 10 years in Central Asia. And we looked at more than 100 energy projects in Central Asia. And what we found was that actually 99% of all energy investment were in fossil fuels and only 1% came into renewables. So, of course, uh, it's often very easy to say that uh, the governments are not doing enough in the region. Uh, but I think it's important not to forget that also external players, they can impose their long term energy agendas on the region. And so, of course, now with like with, the, for example, Chinese investment, one would expect that they uh, they care about the investment and they expect return on investment within the next 15, 20 years. So it means that when uh, there is a discussion, a dialogue with Central Asia about uh, phasing out fossil fuels, uh, I think also this uh, private investors should be also uh, taken into account and maybe also invited to a dialogue in order to have you know some real uh, 
communication with all parties which are involved um, in order to really to make some progress. So it's really important to have this, you know, multi-stakeholder communication uh, with all that have real, real stakes uh, in the energy of the region. Roman, I also know that in addition to your work uh, at uh, in Norway at, at uh, the Norwegian International uh, Affairs Inst uh, Institute, you also have these organizations, Central Eurasia Leadership Academy, right, and then also the Central Asia Development Institute. And uh, how how can you use or how can other consultants perhaps approach these institutes if they want to do uh, more work helping bring renewable energy uh, to Kazakhstan and Central Asia. Uh, thank you, Victoria, for this question. Uh, yes, uh, I was actually one of the co-founders of the Central Asian Development Institute together with my colleague in Uzbekistan back in 2011. And last year, it was a 10 years of, of the Institute. Uh, and uh, if you remember, in the beginning, I was talking about uh, Central Asia and uh, the uniqueness of the region uh, by being, you know, quite uh, disintegrated. And uh, when we were establishing this institute, we thought uh, there should be an organization that would have a regional focus. Um, many institutions in the region, and also this actually relates to many consultants uh, in the region, they are very much uh, focused on their own countries. So it's very difficult to find consultants, for example, in Kazakhstan who would know the Uzbek market very well, mm. or Uzbek consultants who would know how things are and how thing, how businesses operate in Kazakhstan. And the same is actually with research. So we, we, there are very strong consultants and researchers who know very well their own countries domestically. So with this organization, we thought like uh, to create a platform where everyone who is interested in having a regional focus or regional outlook, or even like, uh, you know, things related to two or three countries of the region. So this organization would be a place to go and basically to find a way uh, in terms of cooperation. Um, and the Central Asia Leadership Academy is also uh, an important institute. I was not establishing it, but I'm just a member of it. Uh, but anyone who is interested, I'll be glad to basically share the details of uh, opportunities that are there, that one can take part in it and then become a basically alumni uh, and uh, take part in different activities, uh, well, concerning different aspects relating, for example, to leadership and how to become a strong leader in consulting, also in research. Uh, but coming back to your question, Victoria, about opportunities in green business, I think this is the area that is just starting to develop. Uh, and again, looking at countries, for example, where I'm based now at the moment in Norway, I should say that one already seeing that uh, notions uh, of consulting and uh, green energy, for example, uh, or consulting and environment, uh, it's becoming pretty much the same thing. So more and more consultants, for example, in Norway who do consulting, uh, they cannot anymore exclude the issue of, for example, environmental standards. So whatever project they do, uh, and this can be a project about taxation or about, you know, um, accounting or financial transactions, or maybe just starting a business, any type of consulting project that uh, they operate with here, they often basically already have to include all the environmental considerations, which makes by definition, it's like, it's becoming more or less like, uh, you know, knowing a math. So if you're a pupil at a school, you have basic, right? Skills like math, uh, reading, um, uh, also what's that? Uh, reading, listening to your colleagues. So it's this basic skills that you need. And for consultants to be successful, for example, in Norway, uh, this again, the basic basic knowledge of environmental uh, being actually part of the you know existing projects is very it's like an imperative. So I would say that again, uh, Central Asia is often coming a bit later in many processes, but I would imagine that uh, for future consultants, those consultants that are just starting their careers in Central Asia, I think this is an area to look at. Um, 
because uh, again, I imagine that well, Central Asia will be facing different uh, trends again internationally, and I'm sure that also many international organizations and companies will be bringing their own practices. So it's good to start thinking about this long term. It's quite important. Um, and in terms of opportunities, I know that uh, several big organizations are actively involved, like the Euro Eurasian Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Uh, EBRD has been one of the most active in terms of launching uh, large-scale uh, clean energy projects in Central Asia. Uh, but again, when it comes, for example, to private investment, it has been limited. So one uh, opportunity for consultants in Central Asia would be to interact with investors or those who would like to start new businesses or new startups in the area, for example, of solar or wind energy. Uh, and if you, of course, one can ask like where to gain new knowledge and skills for consultants. Uh, again, I'll be happy to share different um, opportunities for that. Uh, there are many existing schools and also institutes which provide specific uh, certification in the area, for example, of renewable energy or um, regarding, for example, climate adaptation or climate mitigation. So these courses can be like from three to six months where you basically uh, get additional information on, uh, for example, if you're an established consultant, you would just get, uh, you know, certified uh, documentation uh, with where you basically it shows that you have a new knowledge and you are certified to consult new businesses on environmental issues or issues related to clean energy. Yeah, and I just wanted to say that in the same uh, in the same way, like where to get the information uh, to our viewers. Uh, Raman is actually a member of Kazakhstan Chamber of Management Consultants and uh, CMC Kazakhstan. And uh, if anybody wants to to learn more about green energy and green consulting, they can also approach uh, the Chamber of Management Consultants of Kazakhstan and just get in touch with Roman. You can also get in touch through our foundation and uh, just on this on the same note just wanted to to mention that in fact this Kazakhstan Chamber of Management Consultants was established uh, thanks in many ways to to Roman's uh, study of the consulting sector in Kazakhstan uh, which you did and I was in Kazakhstan at that time and I remember your presentation and then that really uh, inspired everyone to create the, the chamber, the Kazakhstan Chamber of Management Consultants. And in fact, Raman became one of the winners of the Gabriel Salim Foundation's International Award for Excellence in Consulting for that particular study. And that was in 2013. He became the winner, but the association was already established in 2012. 14, yes. In 14, right, no, so in 12. Yeah, in 12, yeah, that's right. So mm -hmm. great work. Ron uh, actually you. commented on uh, your um, explanation of one way to actually uh, move to use more renewable energy. And he says that can be an exciting opportunity for consultants to support traditional energy companies with their transition to become integrated energy companies as governments drive the transition through policy changes. Mm -hmm. Do you agree I think with that? Yeah. yeah, that's a perfect comment. And I think that Ron has this ability maybe to read our thoughts because this <laughs> is exactly what I wanted to, to mention about also about myself. Um, I mentioned that I, I started my career um, from working at the oil company Shell back in 2008. Uh, and it's, I think it's a quite of a paradox that um, I first began very interested in the issues of climate change and renewable energy by working in an oil company. Um, so that's when I was first inspired and got motivated, uh, not least because I was working in the Department for Economic Affairs and Communications, where uh, this issue of climate change has become more and more important. And for an oil company like Shell, which is one of the biggest in the world, um, there was a mounting pressure to respond to this issue. Um, there was a pressure to start changing the company to be to make it uh, to change it from a traditional energy provider towards a more um, clean energy uh, provider, and basically to uh, motivate the company to change its policies and strategies. 
So I was working uh, in a very close contact with those people who have been working on the climate policy of oil companies um, and also those that basically are looking into how basically to make this change possible, which is often very, very difficult in large organizations. But I think that, uh, well, today we see examples of not only Shell, but several other companies uh, which are doing uh, some progress and important progress. So these traditional energy providers that they become more, you know, for example, um, oriented towards electromobility. And this is also what Shell is doing at the moment by investing in the infrastructure for the electric cars in Europe. And I think also they have interest to do so in, uh, in North America. Also other companies, they have been quite proactive in this, in this regard. Um, so yes, uh, with respect to Central Asia, I think this is exactly uh, the existing niche, uh, and there are many opportunities for consultants, you know, to, to provide these big uh, oil companies or natural gas companies in Central Asia, uh, for example, in, in Kazakhstan, uh, companies like Kazmune Gas, with, again, with more uh, climate-oriented uh, sort of, you know, development programs and strategies, which also have a commercial value. We shouldn't forget that... Um, I mean, in many countries, there are already very good uh, conditions and terms for companies by those that invest more in, for example, environmental technologies or clean energy technologies. They get special discounts or, um, you know, reduced taxes. So these are special incentives by the government. So which means that by becoming more green, company also, you know, is better off economically. Um, because there are special conditions for that. And I'm, I'm sure that consultants can be also very helpful, not only for the private companies, but also for the government. Local authorities also require a lot of capacity building and uh, understanding of how to make this shift towards uh, green energy possible and how to make this happen in the actual, in the short term. Anya has a question uh, in this regard, sort of, uh bouncing off uh, Ron's comment, she says, from an insider perspective, to what extent do you think oil companies' climate change efforts are genuine and to what extent are they uh, greenwashing for promotional purposes? That's a good question, Hanya. Thank you for this. Uh, I think uh, it's important to mention that, of course, if you ask me like from the macro perspective, whether oil companies are doing enough, I would say not. Uh, they could do more, uh, given the resources and extent of their influence that they have. Um, at the same time, we should also understand that um, oil companies often responding to the demand coming from different parts of the society and the government. So oil companies do not, I mean, they do not really operate in a fully independent world. So in the sense that they have this constant pressure for, for example, provision of more oil and natural gas coming from authorities uh, or like even like uh, local communities or, you know, um, drivers of cars, which actually want to use uh, those resources. Um, plus, we also know that large organizations, uh, they are very difficult to change rapidly from one type of organization to another. It's always a very painful process that can be you know, accompanied by difficult uh, resistance from, for example, from, from within the company. So it takes time. Uh, but at the same time, if you see that some companies are uh, able to make some change, this, I think, can be viewed quite positively, especially those companies, some oil companies today, I know that they declare the, the goal of becoming more um, electricity oriented uh, because electricity is very much based on renewable energy. So that's becoming a, quite a, an important future uh, industry for them. Um, yet still, I believe that, yes, there were so many cases that, um, for example, um, I remember there was a study done by Australian ex experts who said that they looked at how much oil companies spent on uh, their com green campaigns compared to actually actual investment to uh, uh, green energy, and they found that those were almost the same. So, like how much companies spending on promoting their green profiles. So, all in all, yes, they could do more. What's happening is uh, at the moment is not really satisfactory again with respect to the level of 
um, effort and input we need from those companies. But at the same time, I think we should also recognize uh, that often companies manage to make some progress and some, some are moving faster than the others. Um, and I think that this is, again, this is the joint work by, you know, by the consumers, by the local authorities. I think consumers should also be taking part in it, for example, by driving less the cars. This would be also very helpful and could also uh, reduce the demand for fossil fuels, right? Which would make also then the resources produced by those companies not very much in demand. Thank you, Roman. Yeah, for answering this question. Uh, if you have anybody has more questions, please post them. We still have a few minutes that uh, of our broadcasting time. I just wanted to correct myself when we were talking about uh, Kazakhstan Chamber of Management Consultants and Roman's study of the consulting sector. Uh, Gulsum corrected me that we got our dates wrong because they actually the chamber itself was established a couple of years earlier and that, that was connected uh, with, with Gabriel because who, he, Gabriel Salim, who played a big role in inspiring consultants in Kazakhstan specifically to organize the chamber. And then while they were already active, uh, there was uh, their annual meeting, right? And that's where Raman presented his study on uh, the consulting sector in Kazakhstan. And that inspired uh, everybody to create the consortium of consulting organizations, which was uh, actually officially officially announced uh, at the first conference Consulting Without Borders on February 1st in 2012. I hope I got all the dates correct. Yes, that's now, right. that's, that's what happened. And, and you know, thank you, Gulsum, for for correcting us. I think we got one more question from Ron. Yeah. So uh, for consultants that are listening, Roman, can you recommend opportunities for professional development or further information to help support their ability to get involved in this exciting field? Yeah, and that's what uh, I was yes, already talking about, that they can, they can, I mean, whoever is interested can definitely write to the foundation through our website or contact the Kazakhstan Chamber of Management Consultants at least, or any of those organizations in Central Asia, right, that you are a part of, but mm -hmm. maybe you have some other uh, suggestions. Absolutely, uh, Ron, Victoria, I think, yes, uh, that's, that's, uh, I think that's one of my also uh, current missions to um, establish uh, stronger links between uh, uh, local consulting markets in Central Asia with uh, international markets, especially when it comes to the screen consulting. And when it comes to specific opportunities, yes, I'll be happy to, uh, for example, to provide you with uh, contacts and inf contact information and also with specific organizations that already are involved in Central Asia. And this is, for example, Central Asian Development Institute, it's also the, the there's a regional institute for environmental cooperation which is called CAREC in the region. So there are a few uh, actors already. It says that this this new area requires more input, and I'm sure that um, the Kazakhstan Association of, of Consultants uh, can be also very instrumental because it already uh, unites so many consultants. And I think I would be also happy to give a one or two seminars later this year when I'm in Kazakhstan on specifically specifically this topic and I think that those who are interested they could come and attend also just to learn more about opportunities to for example to obtain the new certified education or for example to establish new networking uh, ties with uh, those companies and those consultants that have already substantial experience including if someone is interested in maybe experience uh, of Norwegian companies or Norwegian consultants working in this area. Uh, plus, of course, you can also uh, contact me individually by email. So I'll be happy to, to provide you my responses. Or if you, you can also contact Victoria and she can then let me know uh, about in, uh, opportunities you are interested in. Yeah, I can post uh, your email in the comments. And also I just put up the, the foundations a website and through that website uh, anybody interested can send uh, me personally an email or just contact us and I'll be very happy to forward the questions or the requests to, to Raman. 
Thank you so much. I think we uh, might be heading towards the end for today. We've been talking for over an hour, and I know it's uh, still a daytime in, in many countries. We still have things to do, perhaps, on this May 1st day. And uh, so th thank you so much, Raman, again, for giving such a great perspective on Central Asia uh, and where it stands in terms of renewable energy and green consulting. Thank you also for giving examples from other countries. Thank you for answering the questions. Thank you also for remembering Gabriel and his role in development of consulting industry in Kazakhstan and specifically even some of the, of the research that you did um, so, uh, as everybody knows, we try to organize our events on the first day of each month. So, the next one will be on June 1st. I don't have uh, a speaker for you yet, but please stay tuned for um, announcements. And uh, we'll be happy to post that on the website or on our social media. And as I said, we usually try to focus and talk to consultants and experts uh, who work on global challenges, which do include green consulting, as well as other, other areas of global challenges. Thank you so much to everyone for participating. Again, thank you. Thank you, for inviting me. It and, was a big uh, pleasure. Have a wonderful day. We'll be in touch. Goodbye to everybody. Thank you. Goodbye.